Our text this morning comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. We're going to focus on 6 through 9, but we'll go back and read the third verse. Would you stand with me and we'll read it together? Open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll start with verse 3. I'm reading in the NIV. I also have it in your bulletin. If you want to just look in there, you'll see an insert with the scripture in it, uh, our text. Verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 6. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Greatly rejoicing in all kinds of trials is the title of the sermon. It comes straight from the scripture that we just read. And I got to thinking about this, all kinds of trials, all kinds of trials. And, and what, what, what does that mean? Well, it means just what it says. There's all kinds of them. There's lots of them. And trials of life are common for everybody in this broken world. There's no exceptions. I mean, I don't care if you're saved or not saved when it comes to trials. You're going to have them. Everybody is. Everybody's going to suffer. Everybody's going to have to struggle. And of course, as a Christian, I firmly believe if you're going to struggle, hey, I want God in that picture. I don't know how people go through the trials of life with no no one to pray to, no one to trust in. And then another kind of trial is the trials that I believe Peter was primarily speaking of here, and that's the trials that come as we obey God, as we follow Christ. And there's only a few of us that have those trials. It's like, you want to add more trials to the trials you're going to have anyway? Well, yeah. But you know what? Didn't seem to be a huge problem for the early church in the first two centuries. And uh, you got to keep in mind that the first two centuries after Christ... Christianity was an illegal religion. Did you hear me? Illegal. You would not, if this wouldn't be allowed, what we're doing this morning. And yet, the number of Christians increased from about 25,000 Christians in AD 100 up to AD. 310, there was about, estimated about 20 million Christians. Now, 200 years may not, may seem like a long time to you. It's not. In history, that's just not. And to grow that fast was incredible. How do you think those early Christians did it? At best, they were tolerated. At the very worst, they were severely persecuted. Think about it. Confessing Christ before your family and neighbors could not be done lightly because the consequences were real. It wasn't going to be a flippant decision. You see, they refused to worship the Roman gods and the emperor and That was a challenge to the status quo of traditional religion and the social order of their day. In fact, the very term that you and I use and don't even think about it half the time, we say, Jesus is Lord, 
That was seditious for the early Christians. That was treasonous. Because who was Lord? Well, Caesar was Lord. And for you to say that Jesus is Lord was a direct and a direct affront to the emperor. And that's going to get you in trouble. Christians were sometimes and often, frankly, blamed for natural disasters and plagues or any misfortune that came along in the empire. It's the fault of the Christians. They weren't placating the Roman gods appropriately. They're offending the gods, and the gods are causing this drought, or the gods are causing this flood, and it must be the Christians' fault. And so there would be a rise in the persecution of Christians in order to their desire being, well, let's, let's make our gods happy by, by persecuting these Christians. These Christians stood to lose their social connections that resulted in a loss of a means of livelihood. Think about it. You become a Christian, they find out about it, and they don't trade with you anymore. They don't come to your place of business. Or they don't hire you because you're one of those. Hebrews 10 tells us that Christ followers were insulted in public, taken to prison, and had their property confiscated. They also stood to lose their familial connections. They became an embarrassment to their mom or their dad or their children or their aunts and their uncles, and they would often then just be ostracized by the family. But you see, Jesus knew this was going to happen. And that's why he told his followers in, in Luke 14, 26, he says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Why would Jesus say such a thing? Well, he's saying that when you're forced to choose between your culture, your family, and even your own life, you need to choose me. You need to choose me over your family, over your friends, and in many cases, even over your own life. Uh, this isn't in the sermon. I just thought of it. I honestly believe that I probably lived for two to three decades. And I don't recall hearing a sermon like this. And I remember one day, it's starting to dawn on me what the Bible actually said. And sad that preachers won't preach this. Well, I'm going to. And I'm going to tell you why I'm going to. Because when it finally dawned on me what the truth was about for following Christ, what it meant to follow Christ, it changed my life for the better, not the worse. Brothers, sisters, what I'm preaching this morning is the truth and it's good news. You need to know it. You need to know this. Because see, as hard as those facts were that I just talked about, those early Christians in the first two centuries, it was a major reason why the church grew as it did. And it's a major reason why the church in America isn't growing. It's because people can go for 30 years and never hear a sermon about how you've got to lay your life down. They chose Jesus, even at great cost, because the new birth into a living hope was worth everything to them. Everything to them. Well, that was then, and this is now. What about our culture? What are the primary goals of our culture? I've got two of them up there on the screen. One, a preoccupation with safety and security and an obsession with comfort and convenience.
And the primary god of our culture is consumerism, materialism, money. Because the culture believes that things will provide safety, security, comfort, and convenience. And that is all that matters. Now, I want to be safe. I want to be secure. I don't mind comfort. I'm glad I had air conditioning in my house this last week. I don't mind some convenience. Yes, I've, I like microwaves. It, I, I like a stove. It beats the fireplace. You know, there's things, I mean, I'm, right? But what happens when those become the motivation of our life? The, here's the question. Is our religion only viable if it provides safety, security, comfort, and convenience? Look at the question up there on the screen on the top. Please look at that. And please think about that. And the next question is what happens when we realize that suffering is a part of the plan of God for our lives? I'm going to tell you what happened to me. I didn't like it. I started to go beyond what I'd been taught and preached, heard all these years, and began to read this and began, what, what, what's this really saying here? What does it mean? And then God began to speak to me and said, when's the last time you did something that you didn't do just because you really wanted to anyway? When's the last time you sacrificed comfort and convenience and security and safety for me? When, how? When's the last time you did it, Hal? And began to, to touch my heart. And you know, man, my foot's sticking to the floor. We need to get that fixed. Uh, the tape got the other way around. You know, and so, so I began to think, Lord, uh, I'm teaching Sunday school every Sunday morning for you. And I did that for a long time. I, I'm on the church board. I'm the church treasurer. I fill in and preach for the pastor when he's gone from time to time. I, 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 I do these things. But the truth is, all of that was still within my comfort zone. I was comfortable doing it. And then one day, I decided to go to the altar... You know Christians are allowed to come to the altar, right? All right, just so you know that. I don't know if the church, this church knows that or not, but you are. And you can come to the altar and you can, you can lay your heart out before the Lord. And because and I, I began to realize that there was something more God wanted me to do. But I didn't want to do it. At that altar, I said, yes, Lord, what, to your will and to your way. Uh, I, can, I, can, you know, I can have all the trappings of being a, a Christian, I can do, but, but, but the bottom line is, am I doing what you want me to do? Or is it just what's safe and secure and convenient and comfortable for me? And he says, no, you're going to step outside your comfort zone. You're going you're gonna to be doing some stuff. And it was hard. And he's asked me since then to do some things that have been really, really hard for me to do. And I'm not up here to, to get your sympathy. Because I'm going to tell you something. I've never been happier in my life. I've never been more fulfilled in my life than I am now. I am thankful I'm standing here. Because this is where God wants me to be. Whether I'm comfortable doing it or not. And I keep reminding God that I, I don't have a pastor's heart. And he keeps reminding me that he knows that. And that he will help me to have a pastor's heart. And I see the Lord doing that in my life. What happens when we realize that suffering is a part of the plan of God for our lives? 
Some of you are sitting there going, it is? <laughs> yeah, it, it is. Go read the Bible. <laughs> you might not get it preached to you, but it's very clear in Scripture that suffering is a part of the plan of God. What happens when we realize that God is not as concerned about building our comfort as he is about building our character? Bless me, Lord. Bless me. Oh, bless me, God. Bless me, oh, Lord. Uh, <clears throat> God's thinking, you know, I'd like to bless you. If you're going to bless others with the blessing that I bless you, but you won't. So I won't. But when we say, Lord, bless me that I might be a blessing, which means something that might not be secure and safe and comfortable and convenient, and God says, yeah, I give you that blessing. I'll give you that anointing. I'll give you the Holy Spirit to do that because you become a blessing then to others. If we think about this, fact that if safety, security, comfort, and convenience were the primary motivators of the first and second century Christians, do you think it would have gone from 20-some thousand, 25,000 Christians to 20 million in, two, in 200 years? No way. No way. No way. I've said it before from the pulpit here. I'll say it again. We pray for the Lord to bless our country, our nation, to bring revival. Did, you, did it ever occur to you that some suffering might have to be entailed in making that happen? Think about it. For the church to get to where it really needs to be, that just might need to be the case. We'll leave that to the Lord, see what happens. He is sovereign. Let's go back to 1 Peter, and let's see what the Holy Spirit will teach us. Let's go back to the third verse, and this is what, we, this is what I talked about last Sunday. So I'll spend very little time on this, but I, I think it's important that we read it again. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last time. Yes, God's given us a new birth, and this changes everything. We are a new creation. We have a living hope, an incorruptible inheritance, and a prepared salvation waiting securely in heaven for us. Then we go to verse 6. In all this. Now what's the all this? What I just read. It's what's, it's, it's what's in verses 3 through 5. In all this, you greatly rejoice. Oh, new birth. Living hope. A new creation. An in incorruptible inheritance. A prepared salvation waiting on me in heaven. I greatly rejoice in that. Though now for a little while. By the way, what's a little while? How about your lifetime? Though now for a little while. Because your lifetime is a little while, right? For a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Do you know that the book of 1 Peter is only five short chapters and the topic of suffering is mentioned 17 times. He was writing to a church that was suffering. How do we greatly rejoice even though we suffer grief? You know what grief is, don't you? It's deep sorrow. It's not just feeling a little bad. It's, whew, it's, it's hard. Grief is hard. And, and, and we greatly rejoice even though we suffer grief, not in one or two, but in all kinds of trials. It's a paradox, isn't it? Isn't that what the kingdom of God always is? It always just turns things upside down. 
Well, I think we'll help, what will help us understand it is one of the most important passages, I believe, in the New Testament. Paul writes it in Philippians 3, 7 through 8, and then I'll, and the 10th, 10th verse, and it says this. Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like Christ in his death. This is, are we okay here? Can you guys hear me okay? So I'm getting, whew, something's coming. Maybe the monitors are up a little high, I don't know. Why were Paul and the other early Christians willing to be subjected to such suffering? The answer Paul gives us, they wanted to know Christ, gain Christ, and become like Christ. Number one, what's your priority? Oh, to gain Christ. And then to know Christ, to really know who he is, what made him tick, what makes him tick. What did he teach me? What did he show me by his example? Oh, to know Christ. And then to become like Christ. Bang, bang, bang. Gain him. Know him. Become like him. That's the primary motivation. And if that required suffering, well, then so be it. It's okay. It can require suffering. No, we don't enjoy grief, suffering, and all kinds of trials, but we do rejoice in what the suffering is doing. And that takes us to verse 7. Let's look at it. These have come. What's these? These is the suffering. These are the all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. I'm going to read it again. I'm going to skip the middle part. These trials of various kinds have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So suffering is working many good things. And when I was writing this sermon, I began to make a list of the good things that suffering brings us. And the fact of the matter is, I, when I got to 10, I realized this has got to stop, or we will be here till 1 o'clock. So I, I just said, no, let's, let's, let's focus in, because there's so many things that I don't have time to talk about. Let's go with the first one that he has here in this passage, proving the genuineness of our faith. Is your faith real or phony? Is it genuine or is it a fake? How do you know? How do you know? You know by what happens when you go through trials and struggles and difficulties. Do you remember when we talked that Jesus told the parable of the sower and the seed, that one of those seeds fell on the ground and it fell in a rocky place, and it sprang up real fast, but because it had no depth of soil, when the, as soon as the sun came out, what happened? It died, right? And Jesus says, that's the person, oh, I love you, Jesus, bless me, bless me, bless me. Then hard times come, they're gone. Why? Their faith wasn't genuine. The trial showed it. So the genuineness of our faith really helps me helps me to realize these trials that my faith is genuine. Oh, Hal, you'll serve me until you actually obey me and, and go into the, into the ministry full time. So I'm thinking that. No, Lord, I'll serve you. I'll do that too. You, you mean take, a, take on that? Yeah, I'll do it, Lord. I'll do it. 
I finally, yes, I'll say yes. I finally say yes. Let's do that, Lord. And it proves the genuineness to me of my faith. Don't you think it's important that you know that your faith is genuine? Trials will show you that. And then you can sit back and go, Lord, thank you. I am a follower of Christ. I am someone that can go through trials and still stay faithful to you and do your will. And it also shows that the genuineness of our faith, and this is so important, to others. Trials and, and, and difficulties are a great opportunity to show others Christ in us. And we show them by the way we respond to our own sufferings as well as how we respond to the sufferings of others. Because, because they, they look at us and go, you know, you, you handle that well. doesn't mean that we don't cry and we don't hurt. Of course we do. But the world looks on and they're looking for someone that, you know, because we all have trials. They do too. And it's like, boy, you handle it well though. And then how we respond to other people's sufferings. And how we respond to other people's suffering is we actually care when we see other people suffering. We have empathy and we have compassion for them. Without trials, without the tribulation, how, would we, how can we show that? So what do these do? They show the genuineness of our faith. They give us an opportunity to show others Christ in us. And then the second thing, and I think so important, is it helps us to partake in the very life of Christ to gain him, to know him, and to become like him. You cannot become like him if you're going to run from suffering. That's how we partake in the life of Christ. Because remember the verse we saw that Paul wrote in Philippians? He says, he says allowing us to experience the power of his resurrection, the power of his resurrection, and participate in his sufferings. I can't ignore that last part. Participate in his sufferings. Verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe well, that believe right there means trust. You believe, you trust in him. And you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. To know Christ is to love him. If you don't love him, it's because you don't know him. Because if you knew him, you would love him. And when we love him, we put our full trust in him. Because we know we can, because he's a faithful God, a faithful creator. And we obey him. And we follow him. And what is more important than the salvation of your soul? Tell me, what's more important? Anybody want to say something? Is it comfort, convenience, safety, security? What's more important than the salvation of your soul? What? No. Nobody's got anything. Oh, come on, be honest. No, the, the, the will of God is for your soul to be saved. He wishes that none would perish, but that all would come to him. So if we want the will of God, we want the salvation of our soul. What's more important than the salvation of our soul? Nothing. Nothing. Three weeks ago, when I started this, these, these sermons on 1 Peter... I started the service, if you remember, by, with a microphone in my hand, and I went down here and I said, you know, what, what is it that the Lord has done for you? What has the Lord done? You remember this? And the first person was Sharla Murray. She sat right there on the front row. And what was her answer? He saved my soul. Not he gave me a brand new this or that but he saved my soul. So we look at this verse, look at the, look, verse 9, let's think about it, 
For you are receiving the end result. No, back. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You can read over that so fast. Don't read over that fast. (laughs) Man, think about that. Your faith and your commitment to Christ wanes to the degree that you buy into the gods and motivators of the culture around you. And you become weak when there's no suffering to refine you. You become weak when there's nothing to prove the genuineness of your faith. And you become weak when you complain and grumble and want to go back to Egypt. And for you Christians in here that have been in church a while, you know exactly what that means. To be set free from the slavery of Egypt, go to the wilderness and then go, I want to go back to slavery. But when we complain and grumble and mumble, and and that's, I mean, God just like, oh, help me. Suffering is an inevitable result of following God's ways instead of the ways of the culture. Oh, and you know, let's make it clear. You're going to suffer whether you serve God or not. But when you serve the Lord, you bring on some other things because you, have, you obey him. You put him first. I'm, t- I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get this across. Now, Lord, help me to do this. You, you, you begin to realize that the suffering is a blessing. Is that crazy what I just said? Kind of sounds like it. Because we don't want to suffer or it wouldn't be suffering. But if that's the will of God, if that's what we're supposed to do, there's something about that, that the blessing of the Lord comes that wouldn't be there otherwise. And it's a precious thing. So we let that suffering, those trials, do their perfect and precious work in us. And we always keep a view of eternity ever before us. And there can be a place, I know it sounds crazy, But there can be a place of great joy even in the midst of trials. It all depends on where you're coming from and what your attitude is and and your trust in God and your obedience to him. We are not a Christian just to be blessed by God. We are Christians because we are followers of Christ, period. Christians of Christ, followers of Christ, So, what do we need to do? Let's go to the next. There you go now. So here's a verse. It's also in 1 Peter, but it's all the way at the end of the fourth chapter. And I had to recite it this morning together. It says, So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Wow. Now that's a verse worth thinking about and meditating. In fact, you know what? I think it's so important that I've got it written on a card, and I'm going to give them to you. Can somebody help me pass these out, Chris? Matt? Ray, can you pass these out? Everybody get one. Raise your hand if you need one. You have to take one. It's not optional. You can throw it away, but don't throw it away in front of me. Thank you, Matt. Nothing else that gets us to wake up a little bit. So it says, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves, and notice what I've done here, to their, you see it, faithful creator. That's the highlight of this, on this card. So that when you glance at that card, the first thing your eyes go to are those two words, faithful and creator. Faithful, steadfast, you can depend on him. And creator means he's in charge of it all anyway. He's the sovereign God. He made all this. He made you. He made me. Faithful 
creator. Wow. And then that important word that we used when we did our responsive reading this morning, and that was the word commit. Right? Do you see that word commit in there? We're to commit ourselves to this faithful creator. And then what's the last line? And continue to do good. So, this next week, I want you to seriously examine what primarily motivates you. What's, what is your real want to in your life? Is it primarily, if you're honest now, safety, security, comfort, and convenience? Or is your overriding motivation to gain Christ, to know Christ, to become like Christ by following him? And be honest and be real with yourself. Why not? You need to be. We all need to be. I know I had to be. When the Lord started to ask me to do things, tell me to do things that my, I, I did not want to do. Not initially. And then determine not to run from that which looks... Ultim- <laughs> determine not to run from that that looks hard and looks difficult, but ultimately brings great rejoicing, both in this life and in the life to come. Don't run from it. Remember that suffering acts as a teacher and determine to learn and grow from it. Draw near to your heavenly Father and ask for wisdom and discernment. Say, God, help me to know, why am I suffering? What is it you're trying to teach me here? What is it, God? And then ask him for the strength to persevere. God, help me to stay strong, because I am really weak. I'm really down. I'm really struggling. God, I need your strength. And ask him for his comfort, the comfort that comes in the midst of trials. And that comfort usually comes in just realizing and knowing his presence is with you. Oh, God, I need your presence. I need you close to me, Lord. Oh, faithful creator. We need to remember that Jesus will be right there with us through any trial that we have, any suffering we have to go through, and that it is not in vain that we suffer, and it is not forever. So we greatly rejoice in what he's done, what he's doing, and what he will do. Amen? Just like the early Christians who saw faith in Jesus spread across the entire empire in just 200 years, we will see him work in and through us when our one motivation is to gain him, to know him, and to become like him. And that means that we participate in the fellowship of his sufferings. And we learn what it means to be joyful in that. It means that I'm willing to step out and do things that aren't comfortable sometimes. One last little tes- testimony. I, can't, I cannot be specific about it because it would be wrong of me. But there's been time, there's recently when God told me to do something that hurt a lot. Very specific thing. And what God has taught me is I obeyed, I obeyed him. I did, I did what he asked me to do. What he's taught me has been worth so much. It's been a lesson for me. There's something in my heart that needed to be dug up, and it was deep. And by the way, it still needs to be. I'm not sure we're down at the very end of the route yet. And I have to go to him in prayer. But that, the point is, I'm actually now dealing with that, situ- that problem and my, that issue that God says, now, don't, okay, oh, oh yeah, right, that's right, Lord, I'm going to trust you here. I know I can trust you, God.